Hello there, my name is Terry, and welcome to another episode of the Animation Industry Podcast. This episode is featuring a founder of a studio that makes animation, but not for TV or film or commercials, which the majority of guests that I've had on this podcast do. This chat is about the B2B or business to business side of animation, where studios make animation directly for businesses to use internally or to explain something to their customers or end users. You might have seen some of these types of animations before. A common one is what's called an explainer video or a whiteboard animation. And I think today's chat is particularly interesting because there's a whole other side of the industry that doesn't get as much hype as the films and commercials and TV shows do. And today we're gonna chat all about that, how to get into it, the pros and cons, and what it's like. So in this chat, I'm gonna be talking with William Warren, who is the founder of a company called The Sketch Effect. So a little bit more about William, he is an entrepreneur, illustrator, marketer, and writer who has spent his career using visuals to help communicate ideas in an effective and enjoyable way. And like I said, he is the founder and CEO of The Sketch Effect, which is a visual communication agency that helps make ideas understandable and actionable through animation. They also do live event sketching and graphic design. And some of their clients have included top tier brands such as Marriott, Walmart, Microsoft, Chick-fil-A, P&G, and Delta, in addition to some premier consultancies, including the Boston Consulting Group, Bain & Co., Ernst & Young, and Accenture. The sketch effect is also sketched for thought leaders such as Steve Wozniak, Brene Brown, Malala Yousafzai, Sheryl Sandberg, Peyton Manning, and more. And currently William lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife, Monica, and their young kids, Liam and Gracie. Now let's jump right into the chat. So hi, William, how are you doing? Thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm doing good, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem, it's a lot of fun. We haven't even started yet, so I hope we can keep that uh, attitude going. Let's throughout. do it, I'm all in. Yeah, so I think I think this chat is going to be interesting because usually I talk to people on the production side of animation for TV and film, whereas you're kind of on the other B2B end of things where you've created a studio that caters specifically for business and events with animation. So can you kind of give me like a little pitch or just tell me a little bit more about what your company actually does? Yeah, I'd love to. So at the Sketch Effect, we, we consider ourselves a visual communications company. So we don't tell people we're not an animation firm, we're not an illustration company, we're not a design company, we're a communication company that uses animation and uses design and uses illustration. Um, and our goal is to help our clients communicate their ideas in a way that's understandable and actionable. Um, and like you said, we are a B2B company, so we're working with um, mostly corporate clients, a lot of brands you've heard of, uh, organizations you're familiar with. Um, helping them to communicate their messages, mostly in an internal context. So we do some marketing and sales stuff, but it's mostly internal corporate communications. Um, and so our suite of services really boil down to two. The first one um, is called, we call it Sketch Effect Live. The industry term is graphic recording or sketch notes or graphic facilitation. But in essence, that's when a live artist attends an event, they set a conference or they set a, uh, a canvas up in the room. And while there's content being discussed, whether it's like a brainstorming session or like keynote presentations or um, a customer panel, they're actively listening, synthesizing and creating a real time sketched visual summary of that content. It's really cool. Um, I know this is the animation podcast, so we'll talk about our second kind of core service, which is uh, Sketch Effect Video. And we primarily focus on three different styles of animation. The first is the, you know, the whiteboard style. Most people are familiar with that, where there's a, an artist drawing on camera, creating sketches that sort of come to life and then are animated. Um, so there's that style. Then there's the 2D animation style, which, I mean, you, your listeners are familiar with that. It's mostly raster-based illustrated assets that we animate together in After Effects and add, uh, add music and sound effects and all that good stuff. And then we also will offer a motion graphic style, which we create in Illustrator. So they're vector drawings. They're more kind of infographic-y looking. And, um, and like I said, yeah, we make those videos for mostly corporate clients, explaining internal things like uh, riveting things, like how does the Family and Medical Leave Act work? Um, I know you're in, in Canada, in America, that's the big policy that everyone is, you know, trying to wrap their minds around. 
but we'll make things about um, a new internal training software that everybody has to learn, or we'll make training videos on how to like, you know, for a call center, like how to interact with guests better. So it's a lot of taking messages that would otherwise be considered stale or boring or not exciting, and then packaging it in a way that people get really interested in, excited about, and will actually watch this video. Totally. I like that you clarified at the beginning that you're not like an animation studio. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you, do you get do you get confused as that? Sometimes? I mean we I mean we are I mean technically we are an animation studio. Right. Um, I mean we have a studio and we animate here. Like if you were to walk outside my office, you'd see our animators out there on their Cintiqs and our illustrators, and I could take you back to our filming room. So we are a studio, but from a branding and communication standpoint, we bill ourselves as a communications, uh, a visual communications company. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, just a little kind of a little nuanced way to look at it. And I like that you said the 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 sketch the live sketching part wasn't exactly animation, but I I still think it is. Like in school or just in general, a lot of animators practice life drawing or cafe sketches, which I would think go kind of in line with live sketching, like you got to be quick yeah. and, and stuff like that. Anyway, so I want to I want to talk a lot about what your company does and, and kind of the skills and all that stuff to get there. But I want to know, for you personally, how did you end up pursuing something like this? Yeah, so to, to answer that, we'll rewind about 10 years. So about 10 years ago, I was working in corporate America uh in marketing doing corporate marketing and it was a great job i was working on mostly like social media marketing email marketing for a pretty big fast food chain here in the united states and actually now they're in canada too um and it was great i learned a lot learned a lot about business learned about how to work with agencies and vendors i was on the client side of that relationship so I learned what a good vendor was what a bad vendor was uh, learned about marketing and communication, things like that. However, I'm also a creative at heart. So rewinding back even further, growing up, I was always interested in illustration and cartoons and animation and doodling. And so I, I even have a master's degree in illustration from Savannah College of Art and Design. And so while I, I found myself in this corporate job and I could tell that my creative soul was like shriveling up, like it was, it was like dying a slow, painful death. So, um, in order to uh, have a creative outlet, in order just to make kind of my day-to-day -day a little bit more creatively invigorating, I would sketch during meetings, um, either in my notebook, like my, my personal notebook, or if we were having a team meeting, I might jump up on the whiteboard and get some dry erase markers and just kind of doodle out kind of what we were talking about. Or let's say I had a presentation to give. I would sketch out my concepts, scan them in, and put them into my PowerPoint deck to make it you know, a more interesting creative PowerPoint. <laughs> and uh, for me, that was a, just a creative outlet. But what I soon realized is that people really found value in that form of communication, that form of visual communication, sort of taking ideas and marrying them with visuals to make the entire communication experience more impactful and valuable and fun. And so soon people around the organization began to ask me to do this for them, just for just because they wanted it, and my boss was okay with that, so I did that. And then soon enough, people outside of the organization started asking me to do this, and they were willing to pay me. And then all of a sudden, it was like the lights clicked, and it was like the world opened up, and I realized, holy crap, there could be a business based on this idea of taking taking just simple visual concepts and using them to communicate um, business ideas, corporate ideas, uh, things like that. So. That was about six and a half years ago, and I left. At that point, I decided to, to leave my job and start a business doing this visual communication work. And so, yeah, we started off with a bunch of products that we offered, and over the years, we've really focused down to those two things I mentioned, the live event yeah. sketching and then the animation. So uh, uh, your story actually sounds kind of similar to mine. I also had a career in marketing and uh but yours sounds a little bit more organically like you ended up where you are versus like I like completely switched worlds, like gave up the marketing and now I'm doing animation. But I'm wondering, for me, I went into business because uh, out of high school, I saw that more as a stable path that, you know, I could make a living at. I didn't see too much opportunity in animation. Why did you get a master's in illustration and then decided 
to work in marketing? Just trying to figure out what to do. I was mid twenty yeah. something, and uh, I I just moved to Atlanta from Washington D.C. and uh, yeah, I was kind of in that that kind of twenty something world trying to figure it out. I knew I loved art. I knew I loved illustration. At the time, I thought it was only either like editorial, like magazine print stuff or kids books. Yeah. Or, or you move to California and you'd be a Pixar animator. It was like, those were That's the strange. options in my, in my, you know, in my mindset, that was the things I could do. So I was like, well, I could figure something out. So, um, so yeah, I went and got my master's degree in illustration, but it was during that time that I decided to pivot and go kind of pursue this corporate path, which I ended up pivoting away from. And now I'm doing this entrepreneurial thing, uh, which is kind of cool. It's sort of the intersection of both of those yeah. uh, interests, like the this sort of creative kind of artistic side of me, but also tapping into things I really do love about the corporate side, like working with people and solving problems and communicating and um, things like that and leadership. So it's been kind of a neat, it's neat experience to see those two worlds. So where Which, you're at now with the sketch effect and, and kind of the company you've built and the client relationships and stuff, are you kind of living the dream in your mind from what you set out originally when you discovered that you loved illustrating and stuff? Yeah, I mean, the entrepreneurial journey is always full of ups and downs. Anyone who's done it knows that's the case. But yeah, we're living the dream. I mean, before when I was contemplating starting this business, I didn't even know if people would ever hire us to do this. You know, and now we're six and a half years in. We've got uh, a great roster of clients and um, almost 20 team members between full time and contractors that we work with. And so, yeah, we're living we're living the dream. But, you know, with any small business enterprise, there's some days that feel like a nightmare. You know, you're dealing with sales problems. You're dealing with people problems. You're dealing with, um, you know, our toilet breaking, which happened a few weeks ago. And it's like this is, this is the life, you know, we're, we're living it and, uh, it's real. Oh my gosh. Well, congratulations on building up a business. Um, I'm wondering how, cause like I'm in school right now and I haven't heard once, like, I, I know that these companies like yours exist because of my past job in, in corporate life, but I haven't heard once from, you know, s students or industry people that there is much of uh, a world where you can go into B2B animation. All the talk is about like working for a TV show or a movie. So what is, what is the industry like? Is there actually like quite a few studios that focus on this? Is it quite small? Um, I don't know. Can you lend some insight on that? Yeah, sure. So to kind of touch on the first part of your question, I think a lot of kids, a lot of people grow up being drawn into animation and drawn into illustration based on the, media they consume growing up, the TV shows, the video games, the movies, that's the kind of, that's, that's typically what inspires someone to go into animation or go into art. They're like, man, I love, I loved watching that movie. So I want to go make that. For me, I always loved like kids books and cartoons and comics. So that was like, for me, illustration had to be that it had to be a kid's book, an illustration, a comic. It had to be something like that. Um, and what I've learned, what I did learn when I was in kind of my corporate job was that there's a whole world of potential clients out there ready to buy animation or ready to buy illustration. Um, and, you know, most art students, most people that are in school don't think to kind of go after clients like that. And so for me, I just kind of happened into it organically just by the nature of um, being in corporate America. But but yeah, it's a great it's a great world. There are a lot of uh, big companies out there, and they need video and they need animation. And um, you know, there are a lot of studios out there doing it. And yeah, maybe it's not as sexy as working for um, some awesome like Cartoon Network show or some Pixar th you know movie or whatever. It might not be as like glamorous as that, that but these co companies have money. They have video or they need video. They need lots of videos and they want it fast. And most of the time they'll just find a vendor they love and stick with it over and over and over again. So it's a great, it's a great thing to consider for, for students who are, you know, in animation or. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you about the, the glory thing. Cause you know, when you went, well, I haven't specifically done this, but I feel like if I was working on the next Pixar movie, I, I wouldn't be able to like help myself from, you know, talking about it or feeling like I was fulfilling some inspiration of my own. Uh, and you mentioned it's not 
quite as sexy. So what are those sexy things with with working on animation for B2B clients? Yeah, I mean, you Where get to rub fulfillment, I guess, come from. Yeah, I think one is you get to rub shoulders with the real like influencers in in business. Like we've done work and I've we've had calls with CEOs and VPs and, you know, these people that are really kind of movers and shakers of, uh, in different industry verticals. Um, so there, there's that, uh, just, you get exposed to some really amazing, uh, people. Um, but then there's, there's also a lot of pride in knowing that your work is actually being viewed by a lot of people. And for many, it's like the best part of their day. Like they might be having a terrible day and reading all these emails and doing spreadsheets. And then all of a sudden they get to watch a video that you made and it's like, Hey, this is like really cool. So for me, I know for our team, it's really exciting to see our work in the wild. Like when we go and visit one of these corporate offices and we, we see our video playing on some screen that's on a loop in like the, the, you know, the atrium or whatever. And it's, it's really cool to see people getting value and, and usage out of the work we create. So yeah, it's a different kind of glory, uh, but it's definitely something to be proud of and be excited about. Nice. Yeah. Um, so I want to actually talk about how you created the sketch effect as a, as like a business. How did you go from, you, well, you kind of mentioned a little bit, just kind of doodling in meetings uh, to people externally finding out about you. And then all of a sudden you're hiring people to, to per, like keep this going. How does that happen? Where did you, what was your first step, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> the first step is just to is just to take a step just to try it like put yourself out there and say hey i do this now and hire me um <laughs> you know for us specifically i was able to leave my previous job in a in a really in a really good way that actually preserved the relationship and to the point where they hired me back um right. like the next day after i left so what? I was wait, able wait, so did you did you already have a buildup of clients before you quit or you just you were like, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to try something new. I had a few jobs on the radar. I had a few things on the in the pipeline. Um, and so that did give me the confidence to to quit. You know, I wasn't just going to like I quit and then figure it out. Like I definitely had some things lined up to keep me busy for the next, uh, you know, few weeks or so. Um, and so. So yeah, when I when I left, when I transitioned out of my full time job, I it was it was a slow it was kind of a slow transition. Most people give two weeks. I actually gave six weeks and kind of winded down. I winded that down, trained my replacement while I kind of winded up the business side of things. That's when I, you know, registered for an LLC and and got the website and um, created a name and and registered the name and got my tax ID number and like all that stuff. Um, so I was sort of winding that down while winding up the business side. And so, yeah, literally my last day, uh, my nine to five was a Thursday. And then I came back on Friday and did, um, did work, but this time it was for myself. And so that was really cool. Um, so yeah, we start off with that one client and then also another client, which was uh, the church that my wife and I attend. It's a pretty big church here in, in, in Atlanta and they were like, yeah, we'll hire you to do some stuff. And, you know, it was small, really small jobs, you know, not a lot of money, but it was, it was enough to get started. And so from that, it just kind of snowballed. Um, I always tell people treat every job like it's the most important job you, you have, because if you do it well, people will, will want to tell others, you know, um, for, for animators like yourself and for your listeners, like your work is, already has some built in marketing value because it it's visual. It's it, you watch it, it's animation. It's really cool. So like the work should be excellent, but you should also treat each job, like treat each client you work with like they're the center of the universe. And if, if you deliver great work and kind of deliver in a way that honors the client, treats them well, you meet your deadlines, you, you charge them what you're going to say you're going to charge, then they, they will have to tell their friends, you know, they'll have to go and spread the word. So that's really been our story. It's just kind of this sort of snowball kind of thing. And yeah. um, so, so really you cool. said, okay, so uh, one question that just popped up in my head right now is treat your client as the center of the world. And you mentioned like hitting the deadline, charging them what you, you said you were going to do, doing the work. Like those all seem like pretty standard, I guess, standard client expectations. Yeah. How do you, how do you go above and beyond uh, what they're expecting? 
Yeah, well, it sounds standard, but you would be shocked at how many people did get that stuff wrong. And I remember this when I was in my corporate job because I worked with vendors and I dealt with them missing their deadlines and I dealt with them delivering subpar work. Um, not all of them, but, you know, some. And uh, so, first of all, it is pretty common sense stuff, but a lot of people get it wrong. So, um, I always, always, always emphasize, like, get those small things right. And you'll already be like ahead of your competition. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, yeah, there are ways to go above and beyond in the in the um, kind of in that client experience. Um, for instance, like answering emails quickly, answering emails thoroughly, uh, sending like little thank you notes once the project's done, emphasizing how grateful you are for the work. Um, just being friendly, I think that's what I think that a lot of people struggle with. It's just like simple kindness goes a long way. Like a lot of in B two B sales, you're typically working with these corporate people who are doing a million things, and they're talking to a million people, and they're answering a million emails. And if you can just make their day and their life easier by being thorough, going above and beyond, being nice, like that, that goes a long way in the kind of client vendor relationship. That's, that's interesting to me. It, it just like everything you mentioned has nothing to do with the actual skill of animating. It's a hundred percent, um, just relationship management and keeping good operations with what's going on. Right. Um, and one thing that came to mind is I remember when we were working in my, one of my previous jobs, when we were working with a studio, um, to come up with a national campaign for us, one of the studio artists had like this massive ego that was just so hard to work with. Cause we'd be like, no, you're not getting our target market. Like middle-aged moms are not going to like this. And and he was just like, no, but the idea is good. And it was just yeah. this battle and made everything so frustrating. Yeah. So yeah, that has, I guess, ego is another thing. Yeah. Um, if you, and it, it, like as a creative, if you get hired to make something for a client, at the end of the day, you are serving them and you're serving their, you know, um, you're serving their, uh, their needs so like and that that's another tension that we could we could get into but there you know there's a tension between like oh, i'm an artist i'm a creative like this is like my, my heart and soul and i'm putting like everything into this but there's also this other side of it which is that you're delivering a product and you're you're delivering a good or a service and um at the end of the day somebody has to buy that and and they they want to buy you know they they're not going to, they're not buying your like creative expression. They're buying a solution. And so in B2B, especially you're hired to solve their problem through animation or through design or illustration, whatever that is. And so, yeah, you got to let your, got to leave your ego at the door and you've got to kind of put this sort of servant mindset on. I feel like I'm going a little bit off track, but I, I just, more questions are popping into my mind. So you're working with anywhere from like, I don't know, a dozen clients at once or something like that. We're working and, with, uh, yeah, dozens. Yeah, dozens. dozens. So how do, you, how do you take the time to figure out what each, because not only do you have to figure out the client expectations, but you also, I guess, in some cases, have to put yourself into the mind of their demographic that they're trying to hit too. So you're not only trying to please the business, you're trying to please the business's customers. Right. Like it's, it's like almost double. So how do you make sure that you're hitting on that with every one of these dozens of clients? Yeah, so we build that into our process. So whenever we uh, work with a new client or, or any client on a, a video project, specifically on an animated project, um, the very first step of our process is what we call a kickoff call or a kickoff meeting if they're local. And the whole point of that call is to understand who is the end user, you know, who is the end audience. So for instance, like Acme Incorporated or whatever would hire us, but ultimately we're there. We're creating a video for them that's going to go to their, 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 their end user, the audience. So yeah, we're trying to figure out what is that audience's, what's the goal for that audience? What is the main takeaway? Who are they? Like what, what do they want? What do they need? Um, and so yeah, that's some of the very first few questions we ask. Because if you don't get that right, the fin the final product's not going to be right if you don't have that. Um, kind of that mindset going into it. So we build that into our process. It's the very first step of a five-step process when we um, create an animated video for our client. And um, 
yeah, we keep that front of mind. Yeah, what is the call to action? What is the end goal? What what is what does a win look like? If 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 a person watches this video and they do the right thing, what does that look like? I I think sorry, just I'm thinking of who might be listening to this podcast. I don't know if they know what a call to action is, but can you just explain? Yeah. What yeah. Is? So um, <clears throat> anytime this is great, I love it. Uh, anytime a client hires us to make a video. The video exists for a purpose. There is a goal for that video. Un unlike, you know, let's say Pixar or Disney, the goal is to entertain the masses and to, to make this amazing, beautiful film. Um, in B2B, the goal is to accomplish X or Y or Z. Um, and so most of the time, that is, that is like a call to action for the audience. So for instance, it might be, they watch the video and the very last frame says, register today, go to whatever.com or, or it might be download the app and start learning it for yourself. So like that's the call to action. It's like the thing that the client wants the audience to do once they're done watching the video. Because for us, the video is usually the, it's like the tip of the spear. Um, the video is not the end. The video is the means to the end. Um, and so the end for them is whatever that action is, whatever that next step is for them. Yeah. So um, in business, uh, there, like A-B testing is a concept where you're constantly trying to figure out the best message or journey for like a customer. So if you're sending an email, maybe you're testing out the copy or you're testing out a button versus link text. Or, you know, if it's a landing page where you want them to sign up for something, you're testing colors and images and stuff. Have you learned over time through your animations what is an effective way to get somebody to engage with that call to action at the end is it is it certain specific things that you put into the animation that really help that flow yeah we haven't done too much like hard research behind that um or, or much analytics uh we should uh but we haven't but we take when it comes for us we try to tell the story in like a like a storytelling framework that we feel like is the most effective. Um, and so it's not, it's not the same as like AB testing, but we, we do try to present a message in a way that um, appeals to like, appeals to story. Like how do you tell a good story? Even if it's about something totally unexciting, like uh, how to register for healthcare policy, um, we try to put it into a story. So, and we, we like the, um, the Donald Miller story brand framework, which is basically, um, begin with the hero. The hero is the audience, not you know, not the not the the vendor or not or not the not the provider or the company. The hero is the viewer. So cast your viewer as the hero, and then um, introduce the status quo and discuss why the status quo is not great, um, and then talk about what would happen if you just continue in the status quo. It's not great. It's bad. At worst, your person dies. You know, that's the extreme thing. Then you introduce the solution, um, and then you introduce the guide, which is you, which is the, yeah. the company, the guide, or the guru, or the master, you know, like Yoda or whatever, who's going to usher the hero through their journey to a happy ending um, using this tool or this solution or this call to action. And, um, and so, yeah, we always end the video kind of on a positive note, like, hey, you can have this happy ending. I mean, we're not that um, kind of... Uh, non-subtle about it. it's more subtle than that but um yeah. but yeah we feel like the story framework is usually an effective way to kind of get that positive kind of call to action at the end if you so um like i've worked with this framework myself before but i'm just wondering it, can you give like a specific example of uh, a client project where you've put this in for instance like just so what it what this actually sounds like playing out for an actual project because right now it sounds like you know, you've got a hero and a story, which is kind of yeah. like a cartoon in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you about a recent one. So we recently did a video for one of our corporate clients and um, they're rolling out a new internal software that's going to help with kind of like HR and benefits and payroll and PTO and stuff like that. Yeah. Super boring. So um, we told the story uh, of like, Hey, you're working here at this great company. We have a great mission. We're on we're on track to do some awesome, awesome work. However, we're being bombarded with, uh, you know, 
too many emails, too many meetings, too many systems, like all of this garbage is really weighing us down and keeping us from, um, from kind of accomplishing our goals. So that's like the status quo, like work's too complicated. There's too much back and forth. There's too much like administrative bureaucratic stuff yeah. in the mix. Then, so that's like the first 20 seconds. And then we introduce this new, well, guess what? We're happy to roll out the new whatever software. This thing is going to help us streamline whatever, organize this, get all your thing in one place so you're only checking one, one app or one software. And then we go into what will this do? So we're like teasing out what that happy ending will look like. If we do this thing, you'll have more time to invest in the work that matters. You'll accomplish your goals. Your team will be more satisfied. So we kind of play out all of these happy ending scenarios. And then we get to the end. So, so in that case, the, the hero is the employee at this firm or like a people leader or a manager. Um, the guide is, you know, the corporate leadership who is deciding to roll out this software. The solution is this software. And then the guide is kind of beckoning the, the employees to go on this journey towards a better, uh, more pleasant, effective work experience. And so for us in this video, it literally ends with this like purse, this like team standing on the bank of this like ocean, looking out at this like beautiful horizon, like new world in the distance. And it's like, come on this journey with us, learn more at, you know, click the whatever, and learn more. So that's a very real example where we've applied that, um, you know, in a subtle way, but it's, it's definitely there. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for walking us through that. I was just picturing this little dude, like emails, like falling on him and he's like weighted down and then. Yeah, literally. I mean, we've, up. <laughs> yeah, we've done, we've done that. I don't know if it was for that video, but we've done one where like people are literally drowning in like a sea of emails. And they're like, they're like, uh, you know, trying to stay afloat and like buried in these emails and like that kind of imagery really resonates. I know with a lot of students in art school, you can't, you might not be able to or an animation school, you might not be able to fathom having so many emails that you like, I mean, maybe you can, but like in these corporate settings, people just get like hundreds of emails every day. Oh, yeah. Well, so we, can, like, we can imagine all the assignments, the hundreds yes. of assignments coming on us. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Let's, let's get a little bit more on track. I think with what I wanted to chat about, which is kind of getting back to the business side of things. So, um, you had just quit your first client was your job and then you were doing uh, projects here and there for your church. How did you end up building out enough clients to then say, I need to hire someone? Like, wh how did you build up the business from just these couple of clients? Yeah, so we just, like you said, we started off with those uh, couple clients and just earned a few jobs here and there, um, asked for referrals, you know, like we talked about with animation or illustration or design, there's sort of built in marketing value in the fact that the work we produce is visual and people see it and they like it. And if they really like it, they'll ask for it. So we just kind of kept kind of riding that, riding that train. Um, in terms of like when I knew it was time to hire or like rent a studio or rent space, um, for me, there were two things. One is I got to the point where I was working like 80 hours a week. And I was like, this is not sustainable. Uh, I just need to hire. Even if I don't, even if I have to pay myself less, like I need to get some stuff off my plate. Um, so that was one reason. And then the second reason is, is like really like practical, but my wife and I were about to start a family and my wife said, Hey, you cannot be, uh, you can't be traveling this much. You can't be working this much. And so I was like, dang, I really have to like start actually scaling and actually start delegating. And so just, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was in 2015, so about two years in, that I hired my first full-time creative role. And that was great because I was able to offload stuff and delegate things and um, free up my time to focus on growing the business. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then uh, a few months later, we hired our first full-time operational person, and that was amazing because at that point I was able to delegate the like client communication, making the proposals, doing the administrative stuff. Um, and so that really freed me up to focus on the stuff I really loved, like the animation and the art and the design and the product strategy and stuff like that. So 
So that's that's interesting to me because my first thought was you would have hired an animator to help with the production, but you the first person you hired was somebody to help out with operations. That was the second person. So the first oh, person, sorry, the second person. Yeah, the first person was actually an illustrator, so helping oh. out with like storyboards, concepts, actual illustration. And to clarify, I had hired some um, contract animators um, during the first, you know, during that first two year period. But it was just on a job by job basis. Like it was, it was kind of when they were needed. Um, so, okay. So um, I've talked to people on this podcast who are freelancers mainly. And, uh, you know, when they hit a breaking point, they have either passed on work to somebody they know or they've just turned it down. What made you instead say, I want to build this into like a studio and instead of passing on this work or saying no to extra work, I'm going to actually hire somebody to work specifically with me, with my brand of, of style and animation and stuff. That's a great, great question. That's, that's a question that anyone should, should ask themselves because you're right. If you're, if you're working and you're one person, you have a cap on how much you can do. So if you want to scale, if you want to kind of grow, you have two choices. You can either charge more, um, which is a great option because then you're doing the same amount of work and you're making more money. That's great. Or you, you hire and you delegate and you, and you grow a thing. And so for me personally, I was just really intrigued and interested in this idea of, of business. I, I love the creative side, but also I'm interested in the business side. So for me, I knew I never wanted to be just um, a one man shop. I think that's a great option for a lot of people. For me, it was just, I'm just wired. I like working with people. I like, I'm interested in branding. I'm interested in business. Um, so yeah, for me, it was just kind of a personal wiring, personal goals kind of thing. But um, uh, there's there's times when it's really hard. I mean, scaling a creative service is really, really hard. Um, there's times when I think maybe I should have just stayed a one-man show and just char <laughs> jack my rates up and, and done that whole deal. But, um, oh, you know, that's a... Uh, that's a that's just a choice that everyone has to make based on their personal goals and why. Right. So the first the first person you hired you hired because you reached a point that you had too much work to take on. How do you reach a point where you know to take on a new team member now? Is it the same thing where your work is growing and you decide to take on someone, or is there a little bit of you're working behind the scenes to grow the business proactively and you're just planning? I guess. Yeah. So I have for the most part operated with the mindset of hire when it hurts. So I Ouch. wait until, <laughs> exactly. I wait until I'm like, man, this sucks. I need people. I need help. So that's been sort of my MO for the last several years. But in the last year or two, we've really tried to get more smart about it. And so um, I won't bore your audiences, but my operations team, they've created these like formulas, like based on how much revenue we want to do, how many projects we want to take on, we need to be hiring X many people. Um, so now we have this whole formula oh, wow. to, cal to calculate it, but it's hard. I mean, a lot of times it's a, it's a gut decision. It's like a, Hey, you know, things are bad right now. Like people are overworked. We're burning out. We're, we're maybe doing work. We're not very proud of. Um, so yeah, I think it's a combination of like that kind of gut feeling, but then I do think it's good to get some, some numbers and some data and some, um, uh, kind of some hard, yeah, some hard, like empirical evidence to back up a choice like that. Makes sense. And that also sounds like a smart decision. Um, I'm also wondering, how are you growing in clients now? Because in the start, you were getting it from word of mouth and referrals. Well, it's the same thing. Um, but now, how are you? Is it still like this six years later? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of repeat business, we get a lot of referrals. But, uh, but yeah, in the last few years, we've really really tried to switch up our strategy and do more outbound, uh, do more actually marketing and drumming up sales and um, things like that. So that's what we're working on now. We have a few strategies to do that. Um, some like really direct ones, like trying to sell to clients you really want to work with, like not necessarily banging on doors, but you know, yeah, yeah. banging on LinkedIn or whatever <laughs> yeah. uh, to try to find people. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of that kind of warm, organic, just like the kind of the natural, uh, the natural progress of things, but then also trying to get ahead of it through outbound um, outreach and sales and things like that. 
Fair enough. Um, now, before we were, we kind of touched on the process a little bit where you said kind of animation is one of the, the, maybe not the last steps, but there's all this relationship management up front. Can you take me through the process of uh, you've, you've contacted someone and you've agreed to do some work for them all the way to delivering the final product? And I'm kind of interested where the animation fits in throughout. Yeah, so I, I already talked about the kickoff call. That's our first step. Yeah. The second step is we write the script. So before we animate, before we do anything, we uh, use our, we work with our team of writers and we write the actual voiceover. So the 99% of our animation has a voiceover. Um, we have done a few times where it's just like typographic and you know driven by the actual visuals, but the vast majority of the time we have voiceovers. And so we write the script that will become that voiceover. Because we don't want to start any conceptual stuff or any animation stuff until we know what the actual um, words are going to be. Um, the work we do is very conceptual. I mean, we're, con we're conceptualizing things like, I mean, we already covered it. We're conceptualizing a lot of these like kind of corporate ideas that are sometimes not so, um, not so riveting. So our concepts are really driven by the script. And we write the scripts in a way that will be more uh, visually uh translatable or whatever um so we intentionally try to do that but once the script is approved step three is storyboard and that's when we we get together we we get out our paper and we start mocking up uh shots and sequences and, and concepts and stuff like that and um it's a lot of fun that's when we take the script and we take a blank sheet of paper and we think how can we tell this this line through through a picture how can we communicate this through a picture um and so yeah we just we jam out concepts we talk as a creative team to make sure everyone likes it and then once we uh, feel good about the concepts we put together um, uh, a, a more polished storyboard that's the client deliverable also a mood board with like color swatches and art style and kind of uh, maybe like a sample or two of what the actual graphics and uh illustrations will look like and then we send it to the client. We hope they like it. And, um, you know, we invite their feedback. So we have multiple like, kind of revisions built into our process. And we invite their feedback because we want it to be collaborative. And like we said, we're ultimately serving them. So if, if they don't like our concept, then we change it. I'll give you an example. One time we did a, a video for a client and we had this awesome concept. And it was this like old timey, like Wright Brothers, like flying airplane, like vintage sepia toned thing and they were like eh that seems that seems old-fashioned we want to be futuristic make it more like robots and we're like okay <laughs> so we scrapped that whole thing the creative team our, our hearts kind of broke in that moment but that's what we had to do we have to react to the, what the client wants i mean obviously we, we want to steer the client into something that's going to be successful at the end of the day like we don't want them to drive the show we don't want them to, to run the show from a creative standpoint necessarily um so there is a little give and take but so yeah, we make the storyboard, they approve the storyboard. Once that's approved, then we actually start making the assets. We start jamming out on the artwork and illustrating the characters and making the backgrounds and, and making the assets. And we, uh, you know, we organize all everything through Dropbox. We have uh, kind of like file sharing things set up. Um, and uh, once we have all the illustrations created, then we usually assign one, one lead animator, maybe two to kind of split up the shots and then just work on creating that finished animation. And then we add the sound effects and the music. We bring that voiceover back in and edit to that, animate towards that, um, and make a final. So I'm wow. sure it's not the most revolutionary process. But no, it sounds, it, it actually, the entire time you were talking, I was just thinking about how this sounds exactly like for TV or film, like the process is almost the same, except the director and producer are uh, paying you. <laughs> yeah from a they're from a business and they're approving the things because yeah. like you have you have the the script writing the storyboards the asset creation i'm assuming you've got people well maybe you're a little bit smaller so you have people who are more of jack of all trades versus highly specialized i guess but it sounds exactly the same i guess one question i do have is though um for instance like a tv show needs background painters because they're creating like these beautiful backgrounds and different set with like principles of perspective and color theory you have character animators who are creating rigs for these characters that are like complex because they're going to be used in a hundred different poses in one episode 
is the animation to that extent of what you're creating? I'm assuming it's not, but it's, I don't know. It's definitely I mean, not I that extent. Some of your animations. So. Yeah, it's not to that extent, and mainly because we're working. You know, we we aren't we aren't charging our clients exorbitant sums of money. You know, if we wanted to charge like 100k per project, then maybe we could do all that awesome stuff. But you know, for most of our clients, they have a price point. We try to stick to it, and also we have a timeline. Yeah. You know, they want it done now <laughs> and if not now as soon as possible so, so what's what's you know, a typical timeline are you creating a full animation from scratch to scratch to finish in a matter of weeks uh we shoot for around six weeks six weeks maybe six to eight depending on how uh quick the client is to to get kind of give us feedback because you know like i said we have these sort of feedback hurdles or feedback gates in the process yeah. um you know a lot of clients will say, hey, we want this right away. Let's rush it. Rush, rush, rush. And then we'll be like, okay, and we'll, we'll hurry and we'll send them our, our, uh, our, our deliverable. And then it'll be like crickets for several days. Like, I thought this was a rush project. Like, That's because they're going through all the rounds of a, the, the person yeah. at the bottom of it, show it to their manager, yep. get approved by the director, go back to the manager, back to the yep. director, then VP, then to the, like, it's yep. ridiculous. Up the chain, down the chain, up, back, up. yeah. So, and we try, we try to educate our clients about that because they'll have these really ambitious timelines like, hey, we want to have this video done in four weeks. I'm like, okay, I get that, but you're going to have to run it through your legal department probably. You're going to have to run yeah. it through your, like, your boss. Your boss is going to want to run it by her boss. Their oh, yeah. boss is going to run it by you know, the PR team, whatever. You know. so, I forgot about lawyers. Yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> yeah, most of the time we try to avoid legal, but um, there are certain – certain subjects uh where they need to get like some in-house legal counsel to sign off on it and right um it's kind of a nightmare because like they'll come back and they'll correct things it's like that's really not that important but they'll you know they'll make little changes and tweaks based on kind of uh mitigating their exposure and stuff like that but cool. well thank so you. yeah Thanks. so it's it we do all those things that you described but we do it in a fast way and also on a on an unbudget way uh, but yeah, we'll do we'll do backgrounds, we'll do character designs, we'll do, you know, sound effects and all that, all those things. But for the most part, most of our team are jacks of all trade, jacks of all jacks of all trades. Yeah. And so we kind of just that's... collaborate and get it done. So um, I'm wondering uh, what kind of people end up thriving in this environment. So I'm assuming jack of all trades. But where what's like the background of the people you hire? Do they come out of animation schools? Are they? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about Savannah College of Art and Design, so we are literally like a mile or two from the SCAD Atlanta campus, and so we hire people out of out of SCAD, uh, people with animation degrees or motion media degrees. Um, and you know, I understand that for a lot of um, a lot of people pursuing their animation degree, like the dream is not necessarily to make a video explaining how to enroll in healthcare coverage. Like, I totally get that. So I'm like, hey whether you work for me for 20 years or two years, like let's just make great animation and let's, um, you know, make work you're proud of. And uh, yeah, whether it's two years or 20 years, like I'm happy to like work with, work with you on, on some awesome animated videos that will make a difference and will be, will be watched and people will love it. And um, so, yeah, we, we hire these great young animators out of SCAD and they're awesome. So when you're when you're looking for people to hire, what's something that you see where you're like, oh dang, like this person really, they should come work for us. Like this is this is something that I really want to bring to a team. I really value those soft skills that we talked about, yeah. like answering emails on time, uh, <laughs> dumb stuff like using proper grammar and being respectful and polite in the process. Um, because ultimately, that's that we're serving clients and we want to be that to our clients. So yeah. we want to hire people that are in line with sort of the cultural values that we already uh, embody and try to embody. So I value those things. But then I just, I just value people that are doers, you know, that are, that, are, that just want to jump in and do work. Um, I think you have some creatives that just want to sit and want to kind of think about it and really like kind of figure it out and all that. And you have others who are like, I just want to do, I just want to create, I just want to animate. And, and I, I definitely am biased towards that person. Gotcha. Um, who's just like going to meet the deadline and kind of deliver what they say they're going to deliver. 
You know, the more people I talk to, everybody says kind of the similar thing. There's this, there's like this bar of skill that you should probably get over. But then after that, it's all about the soft skills, people skills, et cetera. So I'm wondering, um, for Sheridan College, for instance, I will graduate with a thesis film and like all students have a thesis film. That's like your main piece of portfolio. How do I showcase, you know, I have the thesis film which showcases the animation skills. How do I showcase that I'm good at answering emails and, you know, all that other stuff that you mentioned too? One way to do it is to really audit and clean up your social media and like website presence. I haven't, I haven't looked at all of yours. So I'm not, this is not a, uh, oh, a direct, okay. this is, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a, this is a general bit of advice, but like, having a really clean website with really good copy on it and really good photography and like ways to get in touch with you. Um, having an auto responder that's that thanks people for reaching out and says, I'll get back to you within 12 to 48 hours or whatever that window is like, you know, um, yeah, just kind of cleaning up and auditing kind of the visible presence you do have, I think is one way to do it. And then this is kind of obvious, but actually doing it, like actually responding quickly and, uh, being thorough and polite and kind and all that. Um, yeah, I, I when I talk to students, sometimes, you know, they'll send their portfolio and then just anxiously wait behind the scenes for who knows until when they get back. But you're saying like with the, especially with the autoresponder, like follow up immediately and and like maintain that right away. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Follow up right away. Don't don't ghost people. <laughs> don't. Uh, yeah, don't don't leave any question unanswered. Like I think that being thorough above and beyond thorough is such a valuable thing. Like people these days, now we're going way off track, but people just value their time and they value their clarity. So if you can make people's lives easier and clearer, they'll they'll it's a no-brainer. Like they'll want to work with you. Like it, yeah, if you have that bar of quality, if you've already crossed that bar of quality, yeah. then on top of that you make their life easier and you're fun to work with like uh, it should be, it should be kind of a no brainer. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and I guess just to clarify what kind of, uh, animation or professionals or artists really thrive in a small studio space like yours? I think people that it's a good question. I, I was just thinking, cause I know some people who are like, I know I'm a background painter and that's what I want to do. Or, I know I want to do CG character animation. That's what I want to do. And I'm assuming those people may not, you know, find a small studio like yours the best place to fulfill their aspirations, I guess. Yeah, I think people that are okay with unpredictability and um, things being thrown at them and their day kind of changing and switching around and also working on lots of different projects. Um, you know, for us, one of our animators might work on four or five different animations in one month. Um, so I think if you, if you like kind of fast paced, if you like sort of every day is different, if you like working, uh, kind of having a, a, a more um, a role that touches a lot of different areas, then I think that working in a small animation studio is a great choice. I think if you if you say, hey, I'm, I'm a background painter and that's what I want to do the rest of my life and I love it. And I don't want to deal with all this kind of uh you know team stuff or or like corporate stuff like then by all means go on and do that um but yeah i think if you're good with the unpredictability the the like organized chaos or disorganized chaos depending on the studio um yeah. and kind of just doing new things every day i think that this is a good place uh a small a small studio is a good place to consider working gotcha i'm i'm thinking back to how you kind of uh, developed this business in the first place, you were, it, it sounds like you were doing something and then people saw that they wanted it and you realized that. And so it kind of developed organically. Um, but for me, like for instance, you know, I'm in school right now, I'm studying animation, I'm trying to grow my social following, I've got the podcast, et cetera. How can I create or get into something like you've done where you've created a studio that specializes in a very specific thing for a very specific audience, I guess, like, what, what would your advice be to me? It's a great question. I, I think that there is, when you're in school, I think you want to be doing two things simultaneously. You want to be trying everything under the sun. You want to be trying every type of project or, or looking into every kind of industry or every animation type, whatever. So like try a million things. 
But then as soon as you can, start to focus, start to really zone in on the thing that you feel like you were made to do or the thing that you feel like you're best at. Um, also the thing that the market wants, the market needs. Um, so as soon as you can, kind of zone in on that sweet spot and then start just act, you know, taking action in that, in that direction. I think a lot of people, they're like, well, I want to do everything. And then they end up just kind of wandering aimlessly, like trying to figure it out. I think this, as soon as you can focus, then you're already on the right track. Cause then you can build a uh, strategic like sales plans and, and strategic like marketing plans and, and cater your website and, and, and do like Google ads and like join, you know, do podcasts and like do things that are really in line with that focused vision. So hopefully that was a helpful answer, but, um, yeah, it makes sense. You know, and you and everybody's develop... story is different, but I think focus is such a, a, a valuable thing. Oh, for sure. And then you also develop expertise in that one area that other people don't have because exactly. they're at something else or they're generalists too. Yeah. I think that being a nit finding your niche is a great thing to do in the 21st century because with the internet and social media, like people that are also interested in that niche, they'll find you. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, it's like, like you want to, if you want to be known as like a post-apocalyptic grunge, you know, steampunk alien character artist, like go all in on that niche. Like that crowd exists. They'll find you and they'll make you, you know, they'll make you famous or they'll make you, uh, you know, successful. Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe just wrapping up, what's next? What's next for you now? Which ne and, and the sketch effect in general, too. Yeah, we just want to keep keep growing. Uh, we want to just keep getting better at what we do, getting better at our craft. Um, specifically with animation this year, we set a, uh, a goal to try 40 new things um, or in innovations. It's a lot, but even just small things like, hey, let's try to let's try 40 new things that we can do to improve our animation, whether it's like, hey, I have a better storyboard template. Let's use this. Or, hey, I found this software online that helps us pick really awesome color palettes. Like, let's use that. Or I found this software that makes rigging better. Like, what are those things? So that's that's our goal for this year is to try to do 40 by the end of the year. Where'd um, you get the where'd you get the number 40 from? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's pulled out of the hair. I think we figured we could do around three or four a month. Okay, all right, um, that makes sense. Maybe one per project, and so kind of projecting out over a 12-year 12, a 12 timeline. Um, so that's what we're doing, the animation front. And then, yeah, we, we, we touched on sales, but we're trying to get better at sales, doing outbound sales and, and getting our word out, and then also doing more kind of like thought leadership stuff, like this podcast. Like we want to tell our story more. We, wanna, we want to um, – we think we have a great story to tell and a cool brand, and we want to just tell people about it. So uh, – yeah, that's a few answers to that question. What is your vision for what you're doing? Like, if you could have all resources and time, what is that thing that you're trying to do at the, at the end of the day? Man, what a good question. I should spend more time thinking about that. <laughs> um, I think Sketch Effect is a really cool business, and I would love to scale around the, around the globe. I would love to have offices in different cities and, and be working with clients and you know, Amsterdam or Hanoi or Sydney or, you know, Bogota or whatever that place is. Like, I think that'd be really cool. So I would love to, yeah, I think we have a great product and we have a good brand. I'd love to, to take it to the ends of the earth if, if, uh, if the market will let us. Awesome. So step one, 40 new things this year. Step two, 40 new countries. <laughs> exactly. I like it. I, like I love it. it. Do you have any final thoughts for our chat or things you wanted to share? I don't think so. I think we covered a lot of good ground here and I hope, hopefully this was helpful to your, to your audience. And I know it's, you know, they might not, they might not care about like corporate whatever, but hopefully they can take some of these lessons and apply it to, to their life and whatever, whatever kind of dream they're chasing. I think that I think there's valuable lessons that can be applied regardless of what direction you're going in in animation. Yeah. Well, I hope so too. I mean, this is not the typical chat I usually have, but it's, it's like, uh, reminding me of my business days. <laughs> so yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's like, it's just something that's not really uh, purported a lot in school or as an animator is working for a company that does B2B animations. It's, you know, all the glory comes in, like you said, video games, TV and film. So I think talking about this stuff is good. Yep. 
Hopefully awesome. it'll open up a few more minds. And, yeah. and it's, you know, there's no shame in kind of doing a, like a side, like a side thing, like kind of getting some corporate work while you pursue your dream on the, you know, um, on the side. Like I think it's a great thing for people to do because they get better at animation. They can make some money to survive. And then, um, and then they're, they're chasing their dream in the mid, you know, it's like the opposite of like being, going to waiting tables. Like you could, go and animate and make money doing that and then chase your dream at the same time. So totally makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, William, for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. Hey, and, it was uh, great. I hope, I hope it was as fun as you said it was in the beginning. Yeah, it's awesome. I had a good time. I love, I could chat about this stuff all day. <laughs> we'll do a part two sometime. <laughs> yeah, let's make it happen. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. And if you're listening and you'd like to follow William and the Sketch Effect, you can do so by checking out uh, the website or Instagram, which both go by the name The Sketch Effect. And I'll include those links in the description of this podcast. And that's all for now. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, bye.